Well, hello there, everyone. It's time for UXW Bill's quarterly video. I really don't feel like making a video today, I'll be honest with you when I say that. But it just so happens that Naughty Truck really did it lately. What is it? Well, we'll get to that in just a moment, but for those of you who are new here or thinking that you found the perfect how-to video for your own Chevrolet Silverado pickup, this is not a how-to video, and some of the things that you'll see me do in this video are going to be a little uncommon, unusual, off the beaten path with regard to servicing automotive air conditioning systems. So if you're looking for something like that, and you're thinking that I'm going to do everything perfectly by the rules, don't be hating and, you know, find another video that does what you need to have done. You know, back when I made one of the first videos about acquiring this truck back in, what, 2012, 2013? I can't believe it's been that long. Somebody made a comment that the air conditioning compressor drive belt was cracked worse than a teenager's face. Well, the same belt has been on there for the 228,000 miles that this truck has got on it. Only the other day, something happened. And if you look very carefully down there, I'm sure you can see that something is missing specifically the driving belt that was on the air conditioning compressor. I had really hoped that it had simply just chowdered the belt. But alas, it did not, because when the key keeper and I stuck a brand new belt on there, oh, it shot sparks and made a god-awful noise. It had been making a noise for a while, but I had really hoped it would be the, the water pump. You know, something much simpler to replace, but oh no. No, Naughty Truck really had to go and do it this time. Fortunately, I believe the air conditioning system is still under positive pressure, and I don't believe there's been any failure that would result in the system's contamination. I think it's just the idler pulley on the AC compressor that's gone wrong. I'll try to get the scanning electron handy cam down in here so you can see. You spin it by hand, and it still seems okay. But when you put the load of a belt on it, the strain of a belt against that pulley, it becomes rather unfortunately obvious that something's terribly wrong. Yeah, the compressor's not locked up. So I'm hoping that it'll just suffice to recover the refrigerant charge from this system. Change out the parts that you're supposed to change out when you open it, like the desiccant container over there the orifice, stuff like that. And then put the system back together again, check it for tightness, and hopefully go again with a new compressor, which I actually have in the key keeper's car. I neglected to bring it over here with me, but the first thing we need to do is we need to see whether or not there's any refrigerant still in this system, and I think there probably is. And then I need to get around to recovering it. So. We'll get all that set up and see where we're at almost instantly for you, thanks to the magic of video editing. All right, so I'm back, and the good news is that the system is definitely still under pressure, just like it's supposed to be. Both sides are basically at the same pressure, equalized out, just like they ought to be, because, yeah, it's not doing anything now. And in fact, it can't do anything now, and, you know, even a part-time... HVAC guy like myself who's just doing this as a sideline and really not at all professionally and, You know, I got to have all the toys too So there's our testo app Showing us the readings from the 550 digital manifold over there I actually saw an, an older gentleman in one of my classes that had the uh, I think it's the 549 the model without Bluetooth And I was immediately taken by it. These these things are worth the money. This is this is an incredible manifold set. I know a lot of guys buy the field piece. I haven't got those probes and probably gonna have to save my pennies for a while before I do, but I've used this thing a lot in the field at various jobs that I've worked and I would definitely say without question, it is worth the money. I still have my analog gauges, still prefer to use them for certain things like systems where something terrible has happened like a burnout or a compressor shelling out or something along those lines, but for everyday service work, this thing's great. I would buy it again in a heartbeat, and at the time, being as I was not gainfully employed, I had to save for a while to get this. So, all right, we tapped into the system. 
he who admits to using a high-end digital manifold with uh, Harbor Freight adapters probably deserves exactly what he gets and will most likely have it coming sooner or later. But now I'm going to go ahead and hook up the recovery machine, get my cylinder out here, set up the scale, and we'll start pulling the refrigerant charge off of this thing. And Maybe I'll take you along for the ride on that as well so you can see that I've forgotten how to use my recovery machine. All right, here we go. I've gone ahead and hooked up my third hose, gone down here to the recovery machine. Let's go ahead and just crack this open a bit. And we'll come over here and we'll purge our line. That's probably good enough. You can hook up to either one of these for recovery purposes. We'll go ahead and we'll open this up. Now I was using the scale because I thought that the label that had the information on it about the uh, details for this air conditioning system, specifically how much refrigerant it takes, I thought this label was long gone, but it's actually still here. We have a pickup with front AC only. It says 1.6 pounds of refrigerant. So we're purged, our lines are all hooked up, got our recovery cylinder open. Let's go ahead and make this thing happen and will reveal that I have forgotten how to do everything about it. And we kind of want to use this valve right here, assuming you can still hear me, as a metering device so that we're only pushing gas through our recovery machine. And we're starting to pull down. If you get a little too rambunctious and you start moving liquid through here, You'll hear it kind of making a knocking noise, which is not really doing. Let's see what our scale says. Slowly coming up. Being as this is 134A, I'm hoping I won't have to put that in a tub of ice to keep the pressure down. But we'll just go ahead and keep pulling the charge out here, and when it's done, We'll be right back again, thanks to the magic of video editing. Now the other thing that the Bluetooth system will let you do, instead of standing over there in the relative safety of the truck and the beating sun, I can come over here to the shade and bother the wasps that have been nesting near all this junk so I can get stung while I view the system pressures as the recovery machine continues to operate. You probably can't see that very well. You can kind of see what's going on there. The pressures just keep coming down. So we'll let it do that and we'll see how much refrigerant we end up getting out of the system. We won't get it all. You lose some due to the purge process. You lose some in your hoses. Places like that. So it's not quite perfect. You might just be able to see some going by there in the sight glass. Some refrigerant. Over here, we're up to about 12 and a half ounces on the scale and slowly increasing. Yep, the pressures are definitely getting pretty low. And just about a minute ago, I heard one of the pressure safety switches in the system trip. Under normal circumstances, that would serve to cut off the compressor in a loss of charge situation. There's also one for excessive high pressure as well. Okay, I just ended up hitting zero PSI and I went ahead and valved this off, valved the recovery machine off, shut it down. But if you look here, you'll see that our pressures are coming right back up. And that's because we're actually going to be catching some refrigerant out of the nooks and crannies, driving it out of the oil. The refrigerant is very miscible with the oil. That is to say that it, it likes to be with the oil. The oil and the refrigerant, they travel together in the system. So we'll end up getting a little bit more that way. I'll probably fire the recovery machine up a few more times just to get that residual gas. And we're not quite to a pound over here. So it may have been a little bit low on charge. Wouldn't surprise me. I mean, it's a 15 year old truck with 228,000 miles on it. Okay, now if I did it right, we shouldn't have more than just the slightest spit of refrigerant left there in the hose. And that was a little more than I expected, but there definitely wasn't much. And ultimately, 
This thing was reading one pound, 2.6 ounces, but since I took the hose off, that's obviously screwed up my reading a little bit. I also see over here that I've got a greenish color in my sight glass on my manifold gauge set. I wonder if maybe that wasn't the factory charge on this system, or if it was the factory charge, if GM actually put leak detector dye in it. I would have to think that's what that greenish looking stuff is. So now that I've got the charge recovered out of the system, what we need to do now, until such time as I can con the key keeper into changing out the compressor and the other various assorted pieces of the system for me, we'll go ahead and we'll put a little bit of a holding charge with some dry nitrogen on there. So we'll come back over here with this. And I'll go ahead and get it hooked up. And I won't have to put much on there. Just enough to keep it from drawing in any crap or impurities because right now the system is under a slight vacuum. I don't want to leave it that way. Okay, now you can see the pressures have indeed come up a little bit. I would say that most likely that's due to more refrigerant continuing to boil out of the oil in the system. However, again, these are from Harbor Freight. Obviously that means they are not the world's finest pieces and I don't know that they are really 100% vacuum tight. So now that I've gone ahead and hooked up my nitrogen and made sure there was nitrogen up here, we'll just go ahead and pop a little bit of a holding charge on the system. I don't want to put too much on there. You can see as it travels through the metering device that the pressures equalize out. Doesn't have to be much. Just enough to keep crap out of the system. And then maybe, if we actually get around to doing this tonight, I'll go ahead and get some assorted pieces of video concerning the actual compressor replacement. I did this a while ago on the big brown piece of junk before it uh, was traded off in favor of that monster truck over there. And it was much easier to work with the compressor because it was actually up here mounted onto the top side of the engine, whereas here obviously it's all the way down there, and I don't know how hard that's going to be to get at, or if you can really even see the back side of it. I don't think the Handycam's exposure control is coping particularly well with that. I was going to say that, you know, maybe I should have washed the truck so it didn't look quite so dowdy while I made this video, but, um, yeah. Apparently you don't have to wash your vehicle to count on rain of some kind. <laughs> Get these little whirly gig things off of this tree over here. They are everywhere. They get into everything. Yeah. So, all right. Well, I've got enough of a holding charge on there to satisfy me. I don't want it under a whole lot of pressure because the key keeper has already told me he doesn't want to be wearing pag oil when he goes to undo the compressor. Not that I expect him to. We'll relieve the pressure in the system first before we take the uh, compressor out. Oh yeah, it definitely looks beyond any shadow of a doubt as though there was definitely tracer dye in this system. It could well have been there from the factory. I have been informed that they actually do that on some newer cars. But we'll go ahead and put our caps on here for the time being. I don't believe these valves are leaking. I did not get any little of refrigerant out of them when I took the caps off, but I'll do a proper bubble test a little later on when we go to put the dry nitrogen on this thing before I end up ultimately pulling a vacuum on it. So here I am now in the Key Keeper's garage taking a look at the replacement compressor for the second time. I looked at it for a little while before we got over here and I don't know about this. This is very interesting. I was expecting to buy a Four Seasons compressor. That's what we put on the big brown piece of junk. Had good luck with it. To my knowledge, Napa Auto Parts does not carry GM's compressor for this application, but if we look inside this box, and before we do that, I'll go ahead and show you the, what I believe to be the part number there. I'll also show you this. It doesn't fill me with a lot of confidence. I think maybe this might have been sold before to someone who found that it was the wrong part. And 
Believe me, that's the story of owning a 2007 Silverado Classic in a nutshell. It's, it's a pain to get the right parts for the thing because it's not really a 2007, but it's not a 2006 either. So it's, but yeah, it's kind of a pain. But here we have a GM accessory sheet talking about performing a compressor oil balance procedure. Again, I'm not 100% sure how we're going to deal with this because it mentions referring to the service manual to find additional requirements. I don't have a service manual, but I suppose that maybe I could find enough to get by online. The compressor comes with 4.7 ounces of PAG oil in it. Maybe that's all I need. Maybe it isn't. I certainly don't want to burn it out on account of not having enough or putting too much in there and causing other sorts of problems. I don't think the truck says how much PAG oil it happens to need on the information label that's under the hood. But then we have the compressor, and this I don't think, like I said, I don't think that this is just compatible with the GM application. I think this is the actual GM part because this is a Denso compressor. Definitely not a Four Seasons part. Go ahead and see if I can get it out of here. I might have to stop the camera for a moment because it's pretty heavy. Here's the compressor out of its box. It does appear to be brand new. I was kind of afraid that it might try to run away from me here because part of it sits on this idler pulley, this drive pulley right here, and that tends to make it want to roll away, but these grates or I don't know what you call these things on a gas stove. I've heard some people refer to them as hobs, H-O-B, but I think that's I think that's primarily a British term for a stovetop or a cooking element in general. I don't know. Maybe you in the comments would maybe you folks in the comments would like to shed some light on that. This video's got everything, doesn't it? Every kind of digression in the world. But there's the data plate on the compressor. To my great surprise, it was manufactured in the United States. Probably from domestic and foreign parts, but Hey, I'll take what I can get. It'll be interesting to compare it to the one that's in there now. See if it also happens to be a Denso part. I also want you to drain the uh, PAG oil out of the old compressor and record how much of it there is, which I'll certainly try to do. Let's go take a quick look at what's going on out under the hood of old naughty truck. Right now we're just looking at getting things out of the way to make this job easier. I think we're going to take a top-down approach, that is to say get this line off of the accumulator dryer back there, get this uh, high pressure line out of here, and take this thing out. I have a replacement one of those. That I'm having a brain fart right now. That's, that's the metering device, I do believe. I think it also has a, a filtering screen on it. I just, I'm not thinking of the right the right name for it but I know what it is and I have a replacement and I think it's going to be very interesting to see what kind of condition that thing is in after all of these years okay folks I'm just gonna come clean right now I'm gonna take my lumps I am gonna ask that you don't be too unkind in the comments to err is human to forgive divine please don't savage me guess what I think I've probably had the best news I've had all day right now it's not the compressor. I wish I hadn't gone to all this trouble, but you know, stuff happens. And we're going to go ahead and put the new parts in. We'll put the new accumulator dryer in there, put the new orifice tube in, new O-rings on all the things that we disturbed, just to try and make sure that this is going to be a tight system once again. There is, I don't know if I can get a light on it, I'll try to get the part out, maybe not tonight, but we'll try to get it out of there. Look at what's hiding down here, right next to that compressor. There is a little idler sitting there. I did not know that was there. The key keeper did not think it was the problem the other day when he examined this. But that thing is just wobbling all over the place and it sounds like crap when you try to turn it. By comparison, the compressor is smooth. Both the idler and the clutch assembly rotate just fine. So hey, at least the compressor is not chowdered. I can live with that. I think my credit card will very much appreciate it as well. <laughs> you know, stuff happens.
you make mistakes. It's part of being human, and I'm not going to apologize for it. And I expect that people watching this video are going to be decent about it, or, you know, pretty much a zero-tolerance policy for harassing myself or anybody else in the comments. I'm always welcoming diverse viewpoints and interested in what people have to say, even if it's critical. But I have always asked that it be constructive in nature, and I am definitely asking for that now, and I would appreciate it. Save me the trouble if you can't be constructive then just don't say anything at all, all right? Yeah, we made a mistake. I totally own it. But we're going to put the system back together. I'll leak check it with some dry nitrogen. We'll do a leak down test. I'll pull it into a real nice deep vacuum. And I'll put some fresh 134A refrigerant in it. And we'll just see how much longer the old truck goes. I got to be honest with you, there is literally almost nothing I would buy on the new car market today. I'm not interested in driving a damn video game. I don't like touch screens. I don't like electronic nannies. About the only car I'm aware of that you can get without a touch screen today is a full-size Chevrolet van. And I guess if that's the option, then it's the one I'll take because I know that Naughty Truck and I are not going to be together forever. Powertrain wise, we're okay. But the salt that they use to make the roads taste better here in Illinois it's catching up with the old truck pretty bad in spots. There's places where it might very well fail an inspection for something like that. We're getting a little... I'm on focus. We're getting a little raggedy here on the wheel wells. I don't know why it will not focus on those. I guess it's just not having any of that, is it? Okay, well, we'll just keep going then. It's the same thing over here, though. Not quite as bad because, you know, you're facing the outboard side of the road here. You're not into all that salt and crap that's running down the center line. Don't worry about all this dirt and stuff. That's just from where I was using this thing as a mobile gutter cleaning platform. Pull it up alongside the garage and then walk off the tailgate while you're cleaning the gutters and you got your mind focused on that task and make sure you have a camera running so you can submit the uh, recording to America's Funniest Home Fatalities a little bit later on you, know, you want to make sure you have your bases covered but yeah the old truck isn't going to be with me forever but I'll tell you what the way things are looking I'm going to drive it till it drops man just going to drive it till it won't drive anymore So yeah, in a word, oops. <laughs> but oh well, you know, it's a learning experience. And if you're not making mistakes, you're very probably not learning anything. The term I couldn't think of earlier is orifice tube. Now there it is. That's the brand new one, still sealed in its package. We're going to have the old one popped out here in just a moment. I'll be greatly interested to see what kind of condition it's in after all of these years. And I'll show it to you as well those of you who have already undoubtedly corrected me in the comments or been doing the equivalent of digital screaming through your keyboard saying it's an orifice tube you dummy well I get there a little bit later than everybody else usually but I still sometimes get there sometimes <laughs> there it is folks the old orifice tube the key keeper has pointed out that this has a very interesting texture to it. There's like little little globs there or something. And of course it certainly appears to be full of that leak tracer dye, which by the way, again, really riding the short bus here today, the, the label under hood on the truck does in fact say that the system was charged from the factory with leak detection dye. Yeah, there it is. I'm going to start calling that stuff Martian snot. <laughs> you got the new one? Yeah, it's over on the Let's truck. Okay, I'll make sure they're the same. Hold that. Hold that, he says. Yeah, that almost looks like it's... I don't know if I can get that to focus any better. That almost looks like it's been really, really hot or something. It looks badly degraded. It looks like maybe there's some sludge down there. I don't know. 
Doesn't look good. The new one certainly looks to be in much better condition. I would find it very hard to believe that this was manufactured that way. It just it just doesn't look right. But I am the guy who's wrong on the internet. I will openly acknowledge that. A little outlet grill there. Alright everybody out there in YouTube land, this is probably going to be the last portion of video that we'll shoot tonight. What well, with the fact that the neighbors might not like us doing all-night automotive repair here at Walsh Motors. We've got the air conditioning system back together. The new orifice tube is in. We also put the new accumulator dryer into place. That actually gave us a new service port. You might be able to see it down toward the bottom right-hand corner of your screen. It's actually got a proper suction side service port on it as opposed to the high-low pressure arrangement that this thing came with from the factory. I don't know why GM did that that way. But as I remember, my mother's O2 Buick Park Avenue was done much the same way. Now, would an official GM accumulator dryer such as that one have the extra service port on it? I don't know. That's Napa's finest Chinese one. I've got the system brought up right now with some dry nitrogen. And I'm just doing a very short, sweet, and to the point, as if I was capable of any of those things as the length of this video is probably increasingly affirming, <laughs> leak down test. It ebbs and flows a little bit because nitrogen is not perfectly stable as the temperature around it changes, but of course it is much more so than a refrigerant where the pressure changing as the temperature changes is the entire point of the operation. That's why nitrogen is frequently used in air conditioning system repairs such as this because of its stability and also its relatively inert nature. It has a bunch of purposes. That's getting way off the subject. The system could have a small leak, but at this point I would, I would think it's safe to say that it definitely doesn't have any big leaks, and I'm hopeful. I'm optimistic, because we put in all new seals for everything that we took apart, that we probably don't have any small leaks either. I'll have to leave a holding charge and nitrogen on it until such time as we can get the idler, so it, it may be another little while before this video finally gets wrapped up and you get to see, well again, you won't have to wait because of video editing, but it will take me some time to get that tensioner idler pulley assembly, have the key keeper put it in if he's willing to do so, get the system under a deep vacuum, and recharge it with refrigerant and see if the whole thing goes up in a big old mushroom cloud, which is exactly what I would expect, because if there's not at least one calamity in our projects, well, we obviously haven't been fixing it nearly long enough. Well, let's take a quick look at our leak down test here. Looks like we're still doing very well. So in light of that, the key keeper came in here with the idler and tensioner assembly, and I don't know where he's got it, but He's going to show us what went wrong here, or at least the individual pieces of it. I don't know that I can really see anything, but when this was all put together, this thing was just flopping all over the place. My theory is that the dust cap went out of the bearing, all the grease went out, and then it just self-destructed. And of course it took that belt with it. And I guess GM and their infinite wisdom figured it was likely enough to happen that they actually thought it was worth the expenditure of running a separate belt and arranging for the tooling of the pulleys to have a second pathway for that belt. There were some little little ball bearing race things that came out of that, weren't there? Yeah. The tension of itself is fine, but I probably would just... Oh, believe me, I'll just Go treat ahead. myself to a new part. <laughs> Go ahead and get something new. Oh, definitely. So here's the part that I really needed from the very beginning. The automatic tensioner for the air conditioning drive belt. I went ahead and threw the old one in here as well as a random capacitor that was sunning itself on the kitchen table at the other house. I have to test that and see if it's any good. I brought this along because I don't know if during the midnight auto repair portion of this video 
if you were really able to see all the damage here. I was also hoping to get some footage of this before we decided to take it apart. But you can very clearly see where that uh, tensioner pulley got into the surrounding metal as it started to run more and more erratically over time. There's a yellow sticker here on the box. I wish I could peel that off because I'd put it on some other random thing. They talk of a service bulletin, and I think they actually went ahead and included it with this part. I guess I'll move because the key keeper wants to put his cardboard under the truck. Talks about uh, failures of this pulley having been observed as a result of liquid slugging in the air conditioning compressor, and it really makes it sound fun because they actually talk in here about the compressor potentially being blown apart in addition to damage that is done to this tensioner. Now the good news is wherever the old tensioner went, and I guess it's down here in the box again, does not appear, I'll make sure I'm holding this the right way, you thought that was just a problem with iPhones. <laughs> yeah, there we go. There's the uh, relevant portion of the assembly. The pulley would have been here. But you can see we're definitely not broken, and thankfully our compressor is not blown in two. Although, Lord knows, I'm still trying on this adventure, so we may yet get it done, but I don't think so. I'm not really expecting any substantial trouble from this. We'll get the new part installed. I'll forget where I put the belt and spend three hours looking for it. And then I'll realize I should have had the truck on the vacuum pump the whole time. There is, of course, another symptom of the failure that they discuss in this pamphlet. And unfortunately, I do not have the original belt to look for this. Wherever it ended up getting thrown, it happened while I was at work and while I did take a little bit of time out of my busy day to go and try to find the remains of it, I, I never did figure out where I ultimately lost it at. I, I know that I had it as recently as having been in the building parking lot when I came in, but when it popped off a little later that day, I don't know exactly where I would have lost it at because I didn't stop until maybe, oh, probably six or seven blocks later to see what was making that awful ruckus under hood, and that's when I discovered that the belt was just completely gone. So yeah, I can't speak to whether or not that damage from overheating caused by compressor slugging took place. I don't think that was the mechanism of failure here. I think the thing just mechanically wore out and that was the end of it. Here comes the moment of truth, folks. I gotta admit, I'm more than a little nervous about this. I'm just gonna bump it at first. How'd it look? It's fine. Okay, we're gonna go a little longer this time. Well, that sounds promising. And now you just have to check it. Stick your finger in there. I don't think so. I do research <laughs> projects like that with a partner. You put your finger in there. <laughs> no, sounds like we're good to go. I just got to get it charged again now. Pull a vacuum on it and stuff. Now it's just a waiting game, folks. You sit here and let the vacuum pump do its thing. Probably let it spend the next several hours doing this, although we are definitely looking to be off to a fairly strong start. Well, it just seems as though there always has to be some kind of complication, doesn't there? They wouldn't necessarily know what to look at the grass, but if we zoom into the street over there, you can probably tell that it's been raining. So I had to take my cart and everything, put that in the garage, and move all this stuff to the relative safety provided by the hood of the truck. I don't know, a system this old, we may not get there. It's hard to tell, but I don't have to rush it. I can just let it sit and run. My HVAC instructor was always of the impression, and I tend to agree with him, that there's no such thing as too much time on the vacuum pump. The only exception might be for a system that leaks, because then you might end up pulling a whole lot of crap into it, but I don't know, I guess we'll see. 
I'm just gonna let it sit and continue running it. It went up for a while, then it came down a little bit, then it came down a little more. It's kind of wandered around a little bit. We'll just see. Patience is a virtue here. All right, folks, I let the thing have the whole night and all of my work day today on the vacuum pump. We got down below a thousand microns, down about the 950 mark. I decided I was going to call that a victory and commence with the charging. I just went ahead and weighed in the requisite 1.6 pounds of refrigerant. System's running. Here's a look at what our numbers are. Our condensing temperature is about 30 degrees above ambient. And it's about 79, 80 degrees out here right now over in the shade. We'll get the superheat and the subcooling numbers. I'd call them acceptable. You might have a different opinion. I always welcome gentle corrections in the in the comments area because like I say, I don't, I don't have the audacity to claim that I'm a professional. I'm learning this. I'm bound to hit every rung on the ladder of mistakes on my way down. <laughs> but I think we might just be doing okay here. In any event, I'm going to call it good, and we'll just take her down the highway and see how it happens to do. Go in here, and we're pulling in outside air right now temperature will get a little bit better if I set it to recirculate as you'd expect. I should probably get that out of the path of the wind. You probably couldn't hear a word I was saying. But there's our interior temperature. It's about 30 degrees below ambient. Like I say, I'm inclined to kick the can down the road and just see what happens. So as always, I want to thank you for watching. I'm certainly hoping for constructive commentary, gentle corrections. The condenser fans, radiator fans are cycling on and off, just like they do when it's operating normally. So yeah, I'm, I'm going to call it good. Just run it down the highway and see how she does. You can definitely see the pressure difference when those fans cut off versus when they go on, as well as the temperature difference too. Here's a little bit of a video postscript, a very crude measure, and you'll notice I put that in lovely scare quotes, of an air conditioning system's performance is whether or not it's actually managing to condense any water out of the air and start sweating. Which of course we're not doing right now, but that would be a result of the fact that we are having a very rare day here in the flatlands of Illinois. It's definitely kind of warm outside, but it's not a bad day. It's beautiful out here because as you can see the humidity is practically non-existent. So there's not much for that air conditioner to pull out of the air right now. I'll go ahead and update the video description after I've driven the truck for a few days and after the temperature spiked back up, which unfortunately it's supposed to do here in the very near future and I'll let you know how things are going. But thank you again for watching. That's the end of the video. Please feel free to leave a constructive comment if you happen to have one. Now all that I have to do is deal with this over-enthusiastic little fellow. This is something that happened after an oil change, so I'm wondering if somehow some piece of crud, or maybe two pieces of crud, or 200 pieces of crud, given this thing's age, somehow got into the sending unit and is causing this problem.